All right, let's just start two minutes early. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's awesome to be here back at Objective by the Sea. Uh, I'm Ian from Google Project Zero. Um, I spoke here last year about um, a pretty interesting in the wild iOS chain. And my background is in vulnerability research, exploit development. But for the last year, I've spent pretty much all my time um, doing reverse engineering analysis of the ever-increasing number of iOS zero-day full chains that come across my desk. Um, we're seeing these almost every month now. Um, and so the talk today is about escaping the Safari sandbox in iOS 16. And so I'm going to look at just one small part of one of the many chains that I was able to analyze in the last year. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll understand what this thing is. It's not just a pretty picture. Um, so let's set the scene. It's early 2022. You're an attacker that wants to pop an iPhone. You start auditing JavaScript core. Um, we'll have 10 seconds to spot the bug. Raise your hand. The bug is that it's all wrong. Um, <laughs> We're not going to dive too deep into this. <laughs> JavaScript is a garbage collected language, and garbage collected objects, the garbage collection engine needs to be aware of them. So you can't just put a garbage collected object inside a regular C vector, because the garbage collector has no knowledge about how to traverse a garbage collected vector, uh, a non garbage collected vector. Indeed, instead, you need to have a marked vector. And this is actually a very old bug. Um, that was the one that was exploited in the wild. You want to take this, you combine it with some kernel bug, that, that's all we're going to cover of the kernel bug, and you're done. Well, you were done until this bug got filed in the WebKit bug tracker. So this is March of last year. So add a runtime flag for blocking IOKit in the web content process sandbox. So web content is the renderer. So this is where your JavaScript engine, DOM engine, is all running, which previously had direct access down to, in this case, the GPU drivers. This is a GPU driver bug. But in March last year, the web content sandbox profile, which is slightly clipped off the top of this screen, but it says com.apple.webkit.webcontent.sb. Um, used to have IOKit open, uh, allow IOKit open this AGX devices user client, which is um, one of the user clients that gives you access to low level GPU functionality. This bug that we saw changed this statement to first this, to require the granting of an extension uh, in order or to access this uh, GPU user client. Uh, and actually, if you look at this code now, it's even more restricted. And actually, let me just move this a bit. Actually, uh, this whole IOKit allow statement is just compiled out. When WebKit is built, these statements don't exist there at all. In fact, probably relevant for quite a lot of this audience, Whilst this does get compiled out on iOS, it's not quite the same on macOS. The macOS web content sandbox is still much less restrictive than the iOS one. Sorry, there we go. Uh, so we can look at that diagrammatically. Um, on the left here, we've got the web content sandbox where your JavaScript engine um, lives wrapped up inside this web content um, sandbox profile. Down the bottom, we've got this IOKit driver layer. This is the kernel. Obviously, the kernel is not the only attack surface that you, can, that you can reach from inside the web content process. If we're just looking at GPU-related stuff, you know, we've got the metal um, shader compiler service, which runs in its own sandbox, which is also IPC attack surface, often using XPC that you saw in the previous talk. This is not the only service we can talk to. We've got like core media capture session capture sources, you can talk to the AirPlay endpoint, volume controller, format reader. Actually, there's really quite a lot of all of these services that you can talk to. And by this point, I just got tired of making these boxes. There are even more. So there's an enormous attack surface here, both in user space and in IOKit. So it clearly makes sense to try and restrict this. <clears throat> and this is where the GPU process comes in. You want to take all of that attack surface 
isolated away into its own domain. So we move all of the sandbox profile that allowed talking to all of these services over into a separate process, into a separate sandbox profile, similarly for the IOKit drivers. So whilst, this should say before, we had uh, graphics context GL on the left-hand side, which would do your, say, web GL on the upper layer, and that would just talk directly to all of those services. It would get the shader compiled. It would bring that back. It would talk down to IOKit to load the shader onto the GPU and execute it. Well, now the graphics context GL can't do that. It doesn't have the ability to talk directly to those services or to talk to the IOKit. So there's a considerable level, a considerable amount of refactoring that needs to take place here. So our graphics context GL now has this twin remote graphics context GL um, over in the GPU process side. And that is the one that's able to talk down to the IOKit drivers to all the services. We then obviously also need some intermediary between these two, because we want to keep the upper interface from the graphics context GL up into, say, the JavaScript layer. We don't, that shouldn't have to change. What instead changes is the concrete implementation that graphics context GL talks to. It no longer talks directly to the hardware. Instead, it talks to this graphics context GL proxy object, which then somehow magically proxies this over into the GPU process side. This then goes down, comes back, back across, and back up. WebGL is not the only thing that needs to get moved across as part of this. Uh, my backup has failed. <laughs> Oh dear. Um, WebRTC, which also uses these uh, GPU accelerator, accelerated GPU operations for video encoding and decoding. Previously, you just had a media recorder, which could talk directly to this. Now you have a remote media recorder, and then the corresponding media recorder private, which is then this concrete implementation from the web content perspective that actually proxies everything across. And you also have a web GPU buffer, used to be a buffer, it's now a remote buffer, remote buffer proxy. So those of you who have um, who used Safari, who want to do like some advanced rendering stuff, your ears might have picked up when I said web GPU, because is web GPU a thing in Safari? I mean, if you go to the W3C spec uh, GitHub, like their official site, they say, well, you know, in Safari, it's in progress. You know, they give you all these steps where you can, you can turn it on. You actually can't turn it on. But they tell you you can turn it on in Safari Technology Preview. And they also have this quite prescient statement where they remind you, you should really avoid leaving this enabled when browsing the untrusted web. This is pretty good advice. <laughs> because it's not the case that you can actually enable WebGPU. You can't even in Safari Technology Preview, you can no longer turn it on. However, all of the IPC support framework that sits underneath that was never turned on or off. It's simply there, unused, purely as a tax surface, which if you knew it was there, you should definitely have uh, left it off, <laughs> left it unenabled when browsing the untrusted web. So <laughs> the question we're going to try and answer today is, well, what is this stuff? in the middle that connects our web content where we assume we have code execution over to the place that can talk to where uh, the next bug, in, the final bug in the chain uh, will get exploited. So is it XPC? No, it's not XPC. Al although the GPU process is a pretty recent development, Safari and, and WebKit have been multi-process for a long, long time, <laughs> significantly predating XPC which is relatively recent uh, technology. But what about an ancient IPC technology like MIG? Well, it's not using MIG because WebKit is a cross-platform uh, browser engine, uh, although Safari is the main user of WebKit. It, it exists on multiple different platforms. They could use MIG, of course, on other platforms, but weirdly, no one else has chosen to use MIG. I mean, maybe they've refactored everything to use the latest and greatest uh, Google Chrome IPC mechanism called Mojo, which, of course, is not true. Maybe it uses its own custom IDL and Mach message format. Of course it does. Yes. <laughs> Why not? So 
let's dive in and take a quick look at this. So this is um, the IDL format, so this custom IDL format, the main specific language format that you use to define IPC messages between all the sets of WebKit processes. So it's not just the web content and the GPU process. There's also a separate networking process. There's the browser process. All, all these other things communicate using this IPC mechanism. So here we're defining an interface for the remote buffer object. So we define our IPC name, map async, and then it just takes these three C++ um, argument types. This also returns a value, in this case, C++ again, a optional vector of bytes. And the remote buffer object has about seven or eight different IPC uh, methods that it supports. So concretely, what that looks like when you're reading the code, on the GPU process side, you have this remote buffer. This, to concretely implement one of these, you inherit from one of the IPC message receiver subclasses. In this case, this is a stream message, so we want a stream message receiver. You just declare your uh, did receive stream message function. One second. Um, but you don't have to define the contents of this. All you have to define are the handlers, i.e. the concrete semantics of what you want to happen when your remote buffer receives a vector of bytes, in this case, from the other side. And then, don't read this, there's a whole ton of Python scripts that run at compile time that print, emit C++ code that hopefully correctly serializes all of that stuff for you. This is there, and we'll take a quick look at what the vector looks like to protect the innocent, let's get rid of the C++ template magic there, and just look at what's important. So actually, the serialization format is very, very simple. In this case, we've got a vector. We simply serialize the size, the count of elements in the vector as a uint64. We push that into our encoder, and then for every element in the vector, we encode that. So if this is a vector of bytes, it's simply going to be the count of bytes, and then each byte sequentially. So it's a very, very simple uh, encoding format, at least in this case. This then gets wrapped up, as you expect, into a Mach message, um, just a regular Mach message header on the top, and then your payload can either be inside the message body itself, or in this case, in an out-of-line descriptor. So what happens then <coughs> in this particular case when this message is received? So we've seen that the vector type it's arbitrarily controlled by the sender, in this case, because the IPC definition that we see at the top says it takes a vector of bytes. All that the IPC layer is guaranteeing you is that this is a well-formed vector. There it, sorry. It's simply guaranteeing you that this is a well-formed vector. It tells you nothing else. It makes no other guarantees about this vector. So what does their concrete implementation of unmap actually do? Well, first it checks, is this mapped field set? OK, kind of makes sense. I don't really know what this means, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. We'll have a debugger set as well, just for fun. Then if this thing is writable, we'll just mem copy this arbitrarily sized vector into somewhere. It doesn't even matter that at this point we have no idea how big source might be. There just simply is nothing anywhere that compares the size of the vector you've supplied to the size of this buffer. And indeed, that's the next CV that we see here, that there is just no bounds checking in the implementation of <laughs> this IPC message, taking a completely untrusted vector across the IPC boundary and mem copying it into some buffer. Um, we're going to skip ahead a good few steps here over how the attackers are able to take this primitive and build an arbitrary read-write inside the GPU process. At the end of this talk, I'm going to publish a blog post companion to this talk, which goes, if you want to know, into uh, a lot of detail about exactly every single step that goes from here into this bit we're going to fast forward to. So 
I said that everything is sim encoded using this very simple IPC encoder type. And whilst on one level this is true, this doesn't actually preclude you from using a different encoder first to then encode something into here. And so if we look at the encoder implementation for this thing called a resource request, where it's encoding the platform data, it eventually ends up in this code path where it wants to try and serialize a bunch of these Apple-specific types, like NS arrays, NS dictionaries, NS numbers, or the most interesting one at the bottom here, NS secure coding, which might ring some bells for some of you in the audience. Um, from previous Objective by the Sea talks, this ends up eventually reaching this NS keyed unarchiver code um, on the remote side. And this is the path that the exploit then takes. <laughs> it encodes this object, passes it inside this IPC message to the GPU process, which deserializes it. And we're now going to take a look at what that object actually is. <laughs> so BP lists themselves, the BP list is just a, the serialization format that is used for these NS archiver um, objects. And probably. <laughs> The first interesting and terrifying thing about it is that it is very, very large. If we use plutil, this uh, Apple um, property list uh, parsing tool to just give us like a human-readable form of it, it's like almost 60,000 lines of serialized plist. And the thing which is most interesting is if we run strings on this, we start to see a bunch of things that we've seen in previous exploits before. NS predicate operators, left expression, right expression, function expressions. These are exactly the things that were used two years ago in the Pegasus um, exploit from NSO as part of their sandbox escape chain. And so you might be thinking, but didn't Apple like fix all of that stuff? So this came out after Pegasus, I think this is um, early 2022, in iOS 15.1, NS, ex NS expression immediately forbids certain operations that have significant side effects, like creating and destroying objects. I mean, this is pretty strong language. Like, how can this possibly work? Well, if you look at the implementation of what it means to immediately forbid, What's actually happened is that the code has not been removed for all of that functionality. Instead, there are just sprinkled pretty liberally all over the um, deserialization code paths are all of these new extra flag variables, which in their initial default states do prevent, forbid, all of this stuff. The problem is that only works for a certain class of attacker with a cert with a cert under a certain threat model. And in this case, the attacker already has an extremely strong primitive in the ability to arbitrarily read and write bytes inside the target process. Um, so unsurprisingly, what they will do is arbitrarily write all of these flags that prevent this functionality to just turn it all back on. So continuing through the list of strings, we start to see that this is much, much more complicated than the previous um, NS expression payloads, which I analyzed before. It's calling syscalls, maybe. It's taking locks. It's creating threads. It's sending mock messages. It's talking to IO kit. It's even got like snippets of JavaScript code in there. And so, I mean, at this point, it's already clear on a high level what's going to happen. And you can kind of see the path that this is going to take. But from my perspective on Project Zero, my goal is not just to see, oh, on a high level, how does this work? What is it trying to do? It's obviously trying to stage the next, set the stage for the next part of the exploit chain. I want to know, like, at the deepest possible level, how does it actually work? So if we use plutil, like I showed before, it gives you 60,000 lines of output that look like this which is not exactly ideal for analysis. It's just going to 
it is the case that in the uh, Pegasus case that I analyzed, this was actually enough, but that's because the payload was 100 times smaller than this one. So it was possible just to sit there for a couple of days, manually finding and replacing all of these references to different objects to just fix it up into such a state that I could turn it into basically pseudo objective C. But that was just not going to work for this case. It's just way too, I mean, I did try, but it's just way, way too big. Um, so the first stage is to just take that plist, you know, write, write a BP list parser, and you get something slightly more readable, but it's still just nowhere near um, compact enough to be able to figure out what's going on. To look diagrammatically then at what I try to do, so we take a BP list parser, we then try and build an NS archive or a deserializer. Again, I'm not going to cover the details of this, but the blog post that I'll link to will show each of these steps. We then extract out the NS expressions. And even then, it's still too complicated to view in like a linear format. So my next approach was to try and take it into some like graph style view and see if I could eke out the structure of it. So I took all of the nodes in or all of the yeah, all of the nodes in the um, NS expression graph, converted them into this um, graph format and put them into this graph viewer. <laughs> And look how easy this is to understand. But actually, this tool is pretty cool. If you can fiddle with the layout, um, this is Jeffy, Giffy, and you can fiddle with the uh, layout menu on the left-hand side here. And actually, if you start choosing other layouts, you can start to um, have these like force-directed graphs, which kind of show you where there are clusters of different nodes. One of the challenges of getting this laid out in a form that is comprehensible to a human is that you want to kind of remove as many crossing um, edges in the graph as possible, such that you can analyze one small part, move to another part, and move to another part without having to have all these things crossed over. And so I then started going through this iterative process of finding nodes, like in this case, the function called the alloc, which is called, as you can see by the number of uh, the in degrees, the number of edges pointing into it, it's called from all over the place. So I would then just change my NS expression parser to duplicate these alloc nodes so that every time it saw this node, it would output a new copy of a node rather than the same one to try and simplify this graph. And see, in this iterative process is where I ended up with a graph that looked like this, which I had screenshotted for posterity. And so I think it looks kind of, um, kind of eerie and maybe indicative of uh, the true intention of this payload, which is to look at what you're doing on your device. And so after you've done all of this deduplication, you end up with graphs that look like this. I'm sure this is impossible to read uh, on the screen, but I will just read out kind of how you would traverse this and figure out what's going on. So you can kind of start in the bottom right-hand side, and you can see, well, it's taking this uh, NS variable called intermediate address and calling the bytes selector, and you can kind of wrap that into it really is legit Objective-C syntax. And then this is called, this is passed as the argument to NS number with unsigned long. This is then passed into bitwise or with this value of NS predicate utils, which is then calling long, long value, and then write invocation name. So it's getting closer to something which is comprehensible, understandable by a human. However, the problem is that I've shown you one little corner of this graph with tens of thousands of nodes. And this expression here just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding because the whole thing is one expression. That's one of the limitations of NS expression-based programming is you get one expression. Uh, and the insight here is that there is no way that the actual developers of this framework wrote one enormous expression like this. There must be some kind of trick that they figured out to build these enormous expressions. So the task here is figure out what that trick is, 
uh, and then implement that into the tool in order to kind of reverse what they're doing. And so you just <laughs> scroll around the graph a bit, and you start seeing these really weird-looking nodes all over the place, where it's taking this class object of NS null, calling alloc, and passing arguments. Well, NS null is a singleton object, and it has an alloc selector, but it just returns a pointer to the global NS null object. The issue is that NS expression doesn't know that. All NS expression sees is, oh, well, it's calling a selector, passing arguments. So first, I evaluate all of the arguments, and then I pass them to this function invocation, and then I discard the arguments. And so, since those arguments are not used by NS null, they end up being evaluated and then discarded. And this is the trick that they are using to take one expression and split it up into unrelated statements. And so with this trick, we can start to see, uh, well, you can see more of this, this enormous graph. So in this case, it's a tree with five different um, arguments that then each then spread out into different arguments and get passed along like this. So we can take that insight, rather than going off to the dot generator to generate this graph, we can go the other way, and we can, do, it sounds a bit grandiose to say statement recovery. What that really means is when you output something from that graph, every time you see an NS null alloc and you, and you traverse down that, down that uh, edge in the graph, emit a semicolon, <laughs> because that is a new expression. You can then, peephole optimizer also sounds fancier than it really is. It, it, what this really means is that there is a lot of very verbose statements, for example, the way that they did that bitwise and or bitwise or or the other arithmetic, um, which they only use a bunch, they, they use a bunch of fixed mechanisms to do this. And so you can just take those and replace them with a helper function to make the whole thing much more readable. Back to something a bit like Objective-C, which then with some manual refactoring becomes totally readable. There are a few things which are fundamental limitations of NS expression-based programming, like you cannot loop. Um, so they have a bunch of tricks to, to, to effectively unroll loops. Um, and so the manual refactoring is just, well, this is the same, the same uh, statement is repeated 100 times, so let's just put a for loop around that. Um, and after you've done all of that, you end up with code from the tool that looks like this. I still don't, it, there's no point in reading this, but it's still actually pretty readable and definitely much more accessible than the, the stuff we had at the very beginning. And we can start to figure out um, exactly what it's doing. So the attacker at this point is in an extremely strong position, um, but they still want to get into an even stronger position. So they can already invoke arbitrary Objective-C selectors. They can program it in quite a neat way and do whatever they want. Like, surely that's enough. Well, no, it's not. They also want a uh, pack defeat. Um, I don't think I have time to go into the details of this pack defeat other than to say it's very, very complicated, involving having NS expressions running on multiple threads, taking locks of each other, and then traversing the stacks of all the different threads, trying to find stuff. It's um, pretty fascinating. And um, yeah, refer to the blog post that I will link to at the end uh, for the details of this. Oops, skip over all of that. Skip over that. At the end of all of <laughs> at the end of this, they've they've managed to create themselves legitimately signed function pointers for these 22 um, C symbols. Again. Surely this is enough to do whatever it is they want to do, but no. So the next and almost final thing that they decide to do is inside the web content, pro oh, sorry, inside the GPU process context, which is where this has all been happening, they then create a JavaScript context object and start executing a series of four JavaScript um, scripts. So the first one, for any of you who've ever written or looked at JavaScript exploits, this might look pretty familiar. In fact, they use some copyrighted code from one of my friends in here. This is just the standard address of fake object building blocks that you would expect to see inside any JavaScript uh, exploit. 
The thing that's missing is that there is no JavaScript vulnerability that they trigger here. After they set up all of these functions and use this open source int64 type without respecting the copyright, they go back into the NS expression code, and then from the NS expression, they introspect back into the JS context and start finding those uh, the adder of obj array and these other arrays, and they just directly corrupt the objects. Rather, the things that you would do with a JavaScript vulnerability, they just do from the outside in order to effectively unbox, unsandbox the JavaScript here to give it the ability to read and write arbitrary memory. And so then the final step is they build an arbitrary function call primitive from inside JavaScript out into an NS expression. So they spin up some other NS expression thread running in the background, looping, waiting on a spin lock that they create inside an array buffer, the backing pointer of which they've like shared over into the NS expression, and then they build this shared memory function call interface between JavaScript and an NS expression such that JavaScript can call by index any of those 22 function pointers that the NS expression got pack signed for them with their pack defeat. And then the very, very last part, they use the arbitrary read-write to traverse a bunch of data structures in the GPU process, looking to find the Mach port name or the two Mach ports, which are the send and receive writes for the IPC connection back to web content, and then they just hijack that IPC connection that was meant to implement all of this, uh, all of this proxying for the GPU, WebGL, WebRTC. Instead, instead, it no longer implements any of this functionality. It instead implements eight new IPCs, which are the eight IPCs it needs to exploit that kernel bug that we just saw there. Um, so it's a pretty incredible feat of engineering, and it took a really long time to figure all this stuff out. So I mean, I think the primary conclusion and the thing that makes me so sad is the enabler of all of that was just a trivial bad mem copy in 2023. Where was the testing, the code review, the fuzzing? Even if we're not going to rewrite things in newer, safer languages, even modern C++ shouldn't uh, has primitives to prevent this kind of bug, um, but they're all uh, nowhere to be seen. The age of data exploitation or data-only exploitation is definitely here. And yeah, it's still a simple vulnerability, but an extremely complex exploitation framework, which one imagines was not written to only be used once. <laughs> so yeah, um, thank you for listening. After this talk, I'll publish the blog post uh, on our team's blog up here. Thank you.